BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. The Korowai Pass had been closed since the end of the summer when a spate of shallow earthquakes triggered a landslide that buried a stretch of the highway in rubble, killing five and sending a long-haul transport truck over a precipice where it ploughed down the mountainside and exploded on a viaduct below. It was weeks before the dead could be safely recovered and the extent of the damage properly assessed. By this time, the temperature was dropping and the days shortening fast. Nothing could be done before the spring. The road was cordoned off on either side of the mountains and traffic diverted. The town of Thorndike, located just north of the pass in the foothills of the Korowai Ranges, was now contained in all directions but one. Like much of small town New Zealand, the local economy depended on the commerce of truckers and tourists passing through, and when the rescue teams and television crews finally packed up and drove away, many Thorndike residents reluctantly left with them. The cafes and trinket shops began, one by one, to close. The petrol station reduced its hours, and the former sheep station at the head of the valley described by its real estate listing as the town's greatest ever subdivision prospect, was quietly withdrawn from sale. It was this last that caught the attention of Mira Bunting, aged 29, a horticulturalist by training and the founder of an activist collective known among its members as Burnham Wood. Mira had never been to Thorndike, but she had earmarked this particular listing when it first appeared online some five or six months prior. Mira called up a map of Thorndike in her browser. The farm backed onto national parkland, 153 hectares with a perimeter of perhaps eight or ten kilometres. It was not far from the site of the landslide. She switched to satellite view to check. The house was set far back from the road. Above it was a kind of natural terrace that divided the wooded upper paddocks from the open pasture that adjoined the road. Mira enlarged the image and scanned the paddocks one by one. They were all empty. A rutted track showed the owner's habitual route around the property, and she could see that several gates were standing open. When she typed the address into a separate tab, a news article came up at once. Mr Owen Darvish of 1606 Corowai Pass Road, Thorndike, South Canterbury, had recently been named in the Queen's Birthday Honours List and was shortly to be created Knight Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to conservation. Intrigued, Mira read on. She learned that Darvish had begun his working life 40 years ago at the age of 17, clearing his neighbour's fields of rabbits at a rate of a dollar a head. He was a very good shot, and his two most treasured possessions, both presents from his father, were his twenty-two air rifle and his skinning knife, which he'd since mounted in a special presentation case in his front room. In those early days, he'd found a scour plant willing to take the pelts to process into felt. But as the plant had insisted on invoicing, Darvish, now aged 19, had taken the decision to incorporate he had hired an accountant and bought a tin of yellow paint from the hardware store. On the doors of his truck, he had stenciled the words, Darvish Pest Control. Mira read that over its lifetime, Darvish Pest Control had held contracts with all of New Zealand's major agricultural industries, as well as local iwi, runanga, town councils and departments of state but it was a recent partnership with the American Technology Corporation, Autonomo, that Darvish hoped would be his crowning achievement. Autonomo, from what Mira could gather, was a manufacturer of drones, and with its help, Darvish Pest Control had just embarked upon an ambitious conservation project aimed at monitoring the critically endangered orange-fronted parakeet, which, Darvish confessed, was his favourite bird. 
The picture showed a clean-shaven, open-collared man of middle age with a wide, capable mouth and an amused expression. The citation below it praised qualities of ingenuity, tenacity and fair-minded pragmatism, casting him as a perfect exemplar of what New Zealanders flattered themselves to describe as the national temperament. His wife, Jill, soon to be Lady Darvish, had posed for the local paper, grinning up at her husband admiringly, and the reporter had taken pains to qualify that it was she, and not the soon-to-be Sir Owen, who was the true Thorndyke native. The farm had been Jill's childhood home, bequeathed on the death of her father five years prior. Mira had found what she was looking for. She felt excitement rising in her chest. Returning to the government website, she read that the investiture of Owen Darvish was to take place at Government House in Wellington in three weeks' time. She noted down the date, then closed her laptop, picked up her cycle helmet and walked out of the library. Mira would not be home to the tiny rented flat that they shared for half an hour at least, but already Shelley Noakes's heart was beating fast. She breathed deeply and went outside to turn the compost heap and rehearse what she was going to say. Shelley had first encountered Mira planting seeds in the dirt. She had been 21 years old to Mira's 24, and she had sought out a friendship with a fervour that approached infatuation. Officially, the Burnham Wood Group cultivated 18 plots of land around the city, some in the gardens of care homes and preschools, and most in the yards of rented student flats. In exchange for access to their space and use of their mains water, the hosts received half the yield of every crop. That was the official face of Burnham Wood. In truth, however, a great deal of what they harvested had been planted without permission on public or unattended lands. To avoid detection, they tended these guerrilla plantings in the very early morning or wearing high viz to give the appearance of an authenticated scheme. In the event that they were apprehended, they took care never to identify themselves or Burnham Wood by their real names. The political rout of 2016 had brought with it a new mood of deference towards the radically unforeseen. A new vocabulary had come into force. Burnham Wood was a start-up, a pop-up, the brainchild of creatives. And Shelley wanted out, out of the group, out of financial peril, out of the flat, and above all, out of her role as a sensible, dependable, predictable sidekick, never quite as rebellious as Mira, never quite as free-thinking, never quite as brave. To break up with a friend was difficult enough, but after five years of operation, the collective was still nowhere near the point of self-sufficiency that they jokingly referred to as breaking good, Without Shelley's contributions, that dream would recede even further. Mira's ambitions would be crushed. Shelley heard a crunch of gravel behind her and turned in surprise, for Mira could not possibly have made it home so soon. But the person coming down the driveway was a tanned, bearded man of around 30, slightly round-shouldered, his thumbs tucked under the straps of his backpack. Hi, he said. I'm looking for Mira? Bunting? Shelley stared at him. Tony? I'm really sorry, he said. I guess it's been a while. It was plain that he did not recognise her. Shelley, she reminded him. Shelley Noakes. You left right after I joined up. In fact, they had overlapped by several months. A few years ago now, yeah, God. You were headed overseas. That's it, he said, looking hunted. I only just got back. He made a gesture that incorporated the polytunnels and the potting bench. You live with Mira? Yeah, Shelley said. I did back then as well. There was a slight pause. I remember your leaving party was pretty wild, she said. She grinned at him. A solution had occurred to her an exit strategy so clean and absolute that it was almost bloodless. She would sleep with Tony. 
she would sleep with Tony and she would confess what she had done to Mira. And Mira would not be able to forgive her. For Mira, Tony was the one who got away. She'll be out for another couple of hours, Shelley said, the lie coming easily. Hey, she added, do you want to go somewhere and get a drink? He hesitated. Sure, he said, very reluctantly. Great, said Shelley. Just let me go and grab my phone. Tony Gallo was the middle child of five. At university, he majored in political philosophy and gained a reputation for being adversarial in seminars, to the point that he was often asked, in the language of the day, to check his privilege. The last time Mira and he had spoken had been at his leaving party almost four years ago, a night that hung in his memory as a dozen dimly lighted moments. Mira on the dance floor, turning her hands in the air above her head. Mira with an avid look. Mira with her hand around his wrist. Shelley came out of the house and he arranged his face into an expression of polite expectancy as she locked the deadbolt and pocketed her keys. So, what are you going to do now that you're back? she asked as they set off down the driveway together. Freelance is a plan, he said. Essays, articles, whatever I can think up. Maybe a podcast? Like journalism? Yeah. Long form, investigative stuff. Social commentary. I've got a website. And I've had a few things in magazines and stuff. Only online. I've never been paid or anything. They arrived at the bar. My shout, Shelley said. Tony went to find a table. Shelley set down a pitcher of honey-coloured ale and two glasses. Happy hour, she said. Awesome, Tony said. He watched her pour. How's Mira doing anyway? I don't know how much she told you, he said, and then immediately regretted it. Shelley glanced at him. You mean about your leaving party? OK, Tony said, making a comical wince. So, you know... She was watching his expression closely. It was a different time, eh? She said. Completely, Tony said, not quite sure what she meant. I mean, she said, she was pretty drunk. His face felt tight all of a sudden. Is that what she said about it? You really don't have to worry, Shelley said quickly. I didn't, Tony said, until right now. And I don't know what she told you, but she came on to me. Shelley's phone was buzzing. She fished it out and unlocked the screen. It's Mira. He noticed she was blushing. Just Burnham Wood stuff, she said. New planning site, maybe. Where? She didn't answer him at once. Eventually, reluctantly, she put the phone back in her pocket. Did you hear about that landslide? She said. On the Korowai Pass? BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Mira's first thought on coming home to the empty flat had been that Shelley had finally done it, packed up all her things and left without warning and without a note. She'd stood in the open doorway for several seconds before she saw that Shelley's bike was still in the laundry and her beloved bomber jacket was still hanging on its hook in the hall. She remembered suddenly the location tracker app that they had both installed some months ago and never used. She got out her phone to check if the connection was still active, but exited the map before it fully loaded, reproaching herself that it was no wonder Shelley had been feeling smothered. Two weeks had passed since she'd first divined that Shelley wanted out of Burnham Wood. Now, standing in the kitchen with her phone loose in her hand, she told herself sternly that Shelley needed space and then resolved immediately to be the one to give it to her. She would go to Thorndyke alone, at once, 
Tonight, she would scope out the farm. She would give Shelley a few days to relax and hopefully to reconsider. And she would come back having killed two birds, as it were, with one stone. She kicked off her shoes and went into her bedroom to pack. As she hunted through her chest of drawers for woolen socks, she rehearsed in her mind the message she would send to Shelley. At last, she settled on, Hey, Shell, I'm going to get out of your hair for a few days. Reckon you deserve a break. Interesting possible sight in Thorndyke down south. Looks like the town's emptied out post Corowai Pass closure, which could be good for us. Breaking good? I'll let you know. Anyway, take care and see you in a bit. Kiss. And she went outside to load the van. Mira had inherited a 1994 Nissan Vanette from her half-brother Rufus, who was in a touring rock band. She loaded fast, dreading the thought of Shelley coming home and intercepting her. Her duffel bag and camping gear, tools, tarpaulins, silicon buckets for conveying water, fertiliser, seed trays, seeds, polytunnels, a garden hose and her bicycle. But Shelley did not appear, and 20 minutes later, Mira had locked the house and was on her way. She arrived in Thorndyke a little after midnight and parked in the deserted Department of Conservation campsite by the lake. She checked her phone to find a message from Shelley. Get on OK? Hey, thanks for giving me a bit of headspace. Much appreciated. Hope all goes well in Korowai. Kiss. Mira went to pitch her tent, feeling great relief and optimism, buoyed by the clean subalpine air and by the deep mossy scent of the outdoors. She climbed into her sleeping bag and lay in the dark, listening to the distant two-toned call of a roo on the far side of the valley before the exhaustion of the drive overcame her and she fell asleep. The next morning dawned bright and clear, and after she'd struck her tent, she took out her bicycle, loaded the panniers with a day's supply of food and water, and locked the van. She zipped a plastic wallet into her jacket, clipped on her helmet, and adjusted her camera on its branded strap across her chest. The camera didn't work. She'd found it at the tip, still in its carry case, defunct. But she'd taken to heart a reminiscence of her father's, who in his youth had hitchhiked all around the country, that no matter how dirty or unshaven he had been, whenever he wore his long lens camera around his neck, he always got a ride. It was an accessory that seemed to put strangers instinctively at ease. Riding into Thorndyke, the only sign of life Mira detected was behind the window of the petrol station, where the teller was counting the day's cash into the till. He didn't look up as she cycled past, and she continued on up the road without seeing anybody else. The main approach to the Darvish property was through a pair of curving wrought iron gates set into a semicircular stone wall. The gates were closed and appeared to be motorised. Coming closer, Mira saw a hooded keypad on a metal post. After a moment's hesitation, she wheeled her bike up to the keypad and firmly pressed the call button. If anybody answered on the other end, she told herself, she would just ride away back to town. She waited, but nobody answered, and the iron gates stayed closed. Mira dismounted, took the printed maps out of her plastic wallet, and sat down on the driveway to examine them. It was impossible that a farm of this size would only have one point of access from the road, and sure enough, when she pored over the satellite image, she could see a rutted vehicle track, which must be an unsealed service road connecting the highway with the back end of the Korowai National Park. She got back on her bike and cycled up the hill. She had been right about the service road. It was concealed behind a curve in the highway. She stashed her bicycle in a patch of scrub and proceeded up the gravel road on foot, carrying one of her panniers as a backpack. She reached a second gate. It was chained and padlocked, and she could see no obvious tyre tracks in the mud that might suggest that anyone had lately driven through. Feeling encouraged, she climbed over it and set off north across the hill. The track proceeded through a shelter belt of pines, Mira traversed furrow, ridge and furrow, keeping an eye out for creeks and ponds, 
but seeing no water source at all. She was wondering how often it rained in Thorndyke when she crested yet another ridge and found herself on the edge of a wide, level terrace. An airstrip, she realised, because at the far end, parked with its nose towards her, was an amphibious four-seater plane. The sight of the aircraft was so unexpected that Mira leapt at once for the nearest patch of trees, but there was nobody around and she would certainly have heard the engine noise if the plane had landed any time in the last hour. It must have been parked there for at least a little while, possibly overnight, or even longer. Had Owen Darvish or his wife been learning to fly? Mira decided to make her way down to the house to reassure herself, beyond a doubt, that nobody was home. She struck out down the hill, scanning the fields around her and listening out for the sound of voices. The house was a classic Kiwi bungalow, white weatherboard, maybe 80 or 90 years old. The interior was dark, so she got out her phone, intending to shine its torch through the glass, and discovered to her annoyance that it was dead. Stupidly, she had forgotten to switch it to a power-saving mode. It must have used up its battery searching for a signal. She put it back in her pocket and kept walking, peering in through all the windows in turn. Every room was tidy. All the surfaces were bare of clutter. Nothing in the sink or stove. Satisfied, she left the house and continued down the hill. At the northern fence, the dilapidated shearing shed and livestock pens offered ample room for storage and even a place to hide the van, if she ever figured out how to get around the code on the front gate. She headed back up the hill again to take a closer look at the plane. After nightfall, she would drive the van up the service road and unload the contents over the fence, ready to begin preparing the site in earnest the following day. She was just forming this resolution in her mind when she returned to the airstrip, and a man stepped out from behind the plane. He was in his forties, lean, smooth-faced, and wearing a navy tracksuit and an unbranded baseball cap. Mira's heart was thumping, but she knew that the best strategy in these moments was to pretend that she had every right to be exactly where she was, so she smiled and waved as he approached, striding forward confidently. Another beautiful day, she said warmly. He didn't return her smile. Who are you? he said when he was close enough to speak without raising his voice. He had an American accent. Sarah Foster. Mira said, choosing one of her false identities. Is that your plane? He didn't answer. You're trespassing, he said. She smiled bravely and lifted up her camera. Only taking photos, she said, I swear. I cleared it with the farmer, Mr Darvish. You have been on this property four hours and you haven't taken out your camera once, he said. Mira's smile faltered. And your name's not Sarah Foster, said the man. Give me the camera. He put his hand out. Mira took a step back. No, she said. Mira, he said, I am asking nicely. It chilled her to hear him use her name. Dumbly, she slipped off the carry case and held it out. He took out the busted camera and turned it over, saw the cracked display screen, then opened the back and peered into the empty cavity where the battery should be. This is broken, he said, holding it up. I know, Mira said. What are you doing here, he said. Don't lie. I'm a gardener, Mira said. I plant things on other people's properties without them knowing. I cultivate the plants and harvest the produce at the end, and I'm part of a collective. We're like an activist collective. A lot of people know I'm here, she added quickly. A lot of people would come looking for me if anything. Keep talking, he said. I've never met this Darvish guy, and my name's not Sarah Foster. It's Mira, like you said, Mira Bunting, and that's the whole story. He listened to this in perfect stillness, his eyes fixed on hers. He didn't move or speak after she fell silent. It was over, she thought. 
They looked at each other for one second, two seconds, three. And then he held up the broken camera. Sorry, he said. Here. She took it, waiting for him to speak. Her heart was beating fast. After a moment, he said, I guess we got off on the wrong foot. How did you know my name? Mira said. He smiled, took his phone out of his pocket and tapped the screen. Under the list of detectable devices nearby was listed Mira's iPhone. Next time, try leaving it at home, he said. Mira was embarrassed that she'd been so easily unmasked. My name's Robert, he said. I'm sorry to have frightened you. Robert what? she said. You seem like a smart young lady, he said, with a trace of a smile. I'm sure you'll figure it out. Just stay away from the airstrip. I can take off all right, but I'm still learning how to land. What do you mean? I mean, he said, I'll stay out of your way if you stay out of mine. She was still confused. Why would you do that? Because you intrigue me, Mira Bunning, and I want to see your garden grow. He went to move away. Wait, Mira said. What's the code for the front gate? He grinned. 6061, he said. It's a house number backwards. Anything else you want to ask? Yes, Mira said. How do I know you're not setting me up? After a long pause, he said, You don't. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Mira pedalled furiously down the hill, along the lakeshore, into town. By the time she reached the campsite and skidded to a halt beside the van, her legs were trembling so violently that she could hardly stand. She clambered off the bike, unlocked the van to plug her phone into the cassette converter and put the key in the ignition to charge it. By the time the phone's display winked back to life, she was feeling steady in herself again. She typed her pin into the phone, opened her browser and typed Owen Darvish airstrip into the search field. Her first search revealed nothing of interest, so she tried Owen Darvish plane, Owen Darvish pilot, Thorndike private airstrip, all without success. Owen Darvish American resulted in a deluge of news articles about the partnership between Darvish Pest Control and Autonomo, the American company that manufactured drones. She switched her search mode to images and typed Autonomo on its own and found him. Her stomach lurched. The picture was a few years old at least, but it was unmistakably him. She clicked on the image and learned that he was one of the co-founders of Autonomo. He had been the CEO of the company in its early years and now served on its board of directors. He was a serial entrepreneur, a venture capitalist and apparently a billionaire. His name was Robert Lemoyne. Mira heard the distant buzz of a light aircraft, so she looked up to see his plane climbing up out of the valley, then banking west over the lake, over the hills, and out of sight. It had taken Robert Lemoyne barely 20 minutes to execute the man-in-the-middle attack. He had first sighted Mira when she turned off the highway onto the gravel access road and had gone at once to his controls. By the time she reached the second gate, he had forced a connection with her phone, obtained her stored encryption key, and then authenticated himself so that from that point forward, he could appear to Mira's service provider as Mira's phone, and to Mira's phone as her service provider. Not only did he now have complete access to her data, 
If he wanted, he could both alter what communication she received and send messages to anyone as her. It was a flawless capture. Had Mira taken her phone out of her pocket, she might have noticed that the battery was draining fast, and had she looked directly overhead at any time while she was exploring the farm, she might have seen high above her the dark blur of a surveillance drone hovering in place. Of course, she'd done none of these things, but that wasn't surprising. No one ever did. Lemoyne smiled to himself. He, at least, had not been trespassing, Jill and Owen Darvish had invited him to make full use of the place in their absence, but, like Mira, he was nursing ambitions for the Darvish farm that went far beyond the crime of trespass. The Darvishes would have been very surprised to learn that, in fact, Lemoyne had been conducting close surveillance of the region for the past seven years. Not that they would ever find that out. As far as they knew, Lemoyne was just a billionaire survivalist hedging his bets against any number of potential global catastrophes. It was in this guise that he had told the Darvishes that he was prepared to pay well above the asking price for their property on the condition of absolute secrecy until the bunker, he watched their eyes widen, was safely in the ground. He had already purchased a small fleet of diggers and earth movers to carry out the excavation, along with the bunker itself, which had arrived disassembled. But the interment of the thing was only a pretext. The real work would happen in the clean-up. When all these vehicles left Thorndyke, they would return to the port carrying a cargo of rare earth elements worth not just billions, but trillions. If he pulled this off, and he had never failed in any of his ventures yet, he would become, by several orders of magnitude, the richest person who had ever lived. His men on the ground in Korowai were all Special Forces mercenaries who believed they'd been contracted through an intermediary organisation by the CIA. Their mission was to capture the payload in the Korowai Basin, leaching the elements on site and then smuggling them out of the country. And their objective, as they understood it, was to help an alliance of Western nations work in secret to wrest rare earth market dominance away from China. China's stranglehold on the market was indeed of great concern to many Western nations, Given the vast number of critical technologies that depended on rare earths, from smartphones to precision-guided weapons to wind turbines, solar panels and electric cars. But what the soldiers did not know was that their operation was being carried out without the knowledge of the New Zealand government, or the US government, or the government of any country in the world. Only about a half-dozen people on the planet knew the full extent of what was happening in Korowai National Park, and every one of them answered to Lemoyne. Playing the survivalist afforded him the perfect cover. The bunker was the perfect Trojan horse. Mira would be the final piece of camouflage. He was going to do what nobody expected, he was going to put his money into Burnham Wood. Over a fortnight passed without Mira making any mention of when she was planning to return. The date of Burnham Wood's next full caucus hui was fast approaching. The group met quarterly. And Shelley was reflecting that the impending hui might well be the first that Mira had ever missed when she received a text. Mira had... Big news, I think we might have actually broken good, and was heading home in order to make an announcement to the group the following night. Shelley had no idea what Mira's news could be, but if Burnham Wood was truly within sight of solvency at last, then she could quit the group with a clear conscience. She wondered if Tony would make an appearance. It seemed unlikely. When she'd texted him a link to the open source folder that they used as a message board, She'd received no reply. But she called up the Burnham Wood mailing list and, sure enough, he was there. Gallows, 
www.humour at gmail.com. The group held their assemblies in a cafe managed by one of the longer-serving members, Amber Callender, and it had become a tradition to mark each quarter with a ceremonial bowl of soup, the ingredients sourced from Burnham Wood planting sites. Shelley arrived at the Hui 20 minutes after seven to find the scent of lemongrass and coriander wafting out into the open air. She was one of the last to arrive. The chairs had been arranged in an ellipsis, and at the top of the ellipsis, Tony was holding court. He was sitting forward and giving his opinions eagerly and quickly, like someone who had been prevented from speaking for a very long time. Any conversation on the left these days, it's always each person trying to outperform the person before them in terms of their oppression or their lack of privilege or their personal trauma. And by the way, everybody at this hui, he put exaggerated quotes around the word, is white and middle class, just like me. The door opened and Mira walked in. So sorry I'm late, she said to Amber. Then she saw Tony. Oh, my God! But a collective shame had taken hold. The facilitator, a sweet-tempered paediatric nurse named Katie Vander, called the meeting to order and gave Mira the floor. OK, well, hi. Kia ora, Tatu, Mira said, looking around. So, as some of you know, I've just come back from Thorndike, down by the Korowai Pass, where there was that landslide recently. Shelley observed that Mira seemed unusually a little nervous. Tony hadn't moved. While I was down there, Mira went on, I met this guy, this American guy, and as we got to talking, he sort of expressed an interest in who we are and what we do. And this sounds a bit strange, but he's offered to give us some funding. $100,000, no strings attached, just like a donation. I know it sounds mad, and I know, she added, looking apologetically around the room, rich American buying a bolt hole in New Zealand, and he's totally one of those apocalypse preppers, or whatever you call them, you know, like he's brought this farm and he's even putting in a bunker, so full cliche. But for what it's worth, he's invested in this conservation project up north, so his heart's at least kind of in the right place. And I've talked to him a bunch over the past couple of weeks, and I don't think he's an entirely bad guy. Who is he? Someone asked. Well, I guess the only other thing to say is that he's already given me ten grand, Mira said, blushing slightly. I didn't ask him to, but he told me to check my bank balance, and I did, and he had already made the deposit. But anyway, his name is Robert Lemoyne. Tony looked up. He's the autonomo guy. He's not just rich, he's a billionaire. What's autonomo? Someone asked. It's a tech company, Tony said. They make drones. Surveillance drones, Mira said quickly. Not the military kind. Tony made a scoffing noise. Sure, he said, because there's absolutely no overlap. You must remember his wife, he said, addressing the others. Gazella Kazarian. It was this huge deal. She was in a helicopter and it crashed for like totally no reason when he just happened not to be on board. So not like an accident, someone said. No one knows what happened, Mira said tightly. No one, including you, Tony. She turned back to the group. Look, I mean, full disclosure here, she said. He's on one of those investor visas, so he needs to sponsor Kiwi Enterprise if he's going to qualify for a passport. So this isn't just a straight-up philanthropic type of deal. He's getting something out of this too. It's blood money, said Tony. We should kill him is what we should do and call it collateral damage, like every civilian killed by drone strikes in Iraq and Yemen and Syria. So what do you propose, said Mira, losing her temper at last. I give the money back? Tell him, actually, sorry, Mr. Lemoyne, this is blood money, in case you didn't know, so however much good we might have done with this money, none of that matters? Yes, said Tony. He crossed his arms across his chest. 100% yes. Fine, said Mira, duly noted. Any other objections, or shall we vote? I'm in, Shelley said. 
Really? Mira said, turning to her. Yeah, Shelley said, smiling at her. A hundred grand, man. Bring it on. They took the vote. Tony left the cafe shortly afterwards, and the following day, Mira and Shelley boxed up their belongings, gave their house keys to a friend, and loaded up the van for a second time. And as they backed out of the driveway, selected a playlist, and left the city for the open road, 500 kilometres away, under a vast, unsmiling portrait of Queen Elizabeth II, Mr. Darvish knelt, and Sir Owen arose. BBC Sounds, music, radio, podcasts. Sir Owen arrived at the head office of Darvish Pest Control in good spirits, eager to begin the week. His secretary had updated his business cards to read Sir Owen Darvish, K-N-Z-N. And he was turning the card admiringly when his computer pinged and he looked up to see an email in his inbox with the subject heading Request for Interview Ray Robert Lemoyne. Dear Mr. Darvish, it began incorrectly, I am a freelance journalist currently working on an investigative piece about the practice of doomsteading among the super rich. I would like to ask you a few questions about your association with Robert Lemoyne, specifically in relation to your property in Thorndike. Could we arrange a time to speak? Yours sincerely. And then a name Sir Owen didn't recognise and a phone number. Heart sinking, he forwarded it to Lady Darvish with the message, What do you make of this? Barely twenty seconds passed before his phone rang. He picked it up. Shit, said Lady Darvish. The farm had sold, or was about to, just as soon as the conveyancing was done, keeping the original farmhouse which Jill couldn't bear to part with for themselves. Le Moyne had offered double what they'd hoped for, maybe more than double, when you factored in the conservation side project with Autonomo, which Sir Owen had negotiated, rather cleverly, he thought. They were high on the hog, millionaires a few times over, but they were bound by a non-disclosure agreement not to say so, not at least until Le Moyne had put the bunker in. I mean, who is this guy? said Sir Owen. I'm just looking him up, said Lady Darvish. What's the address? Gallo's Humour. Yeah, I'm on his website. Anthony Gallo. The morning after the disastrous vote at Burnham Wood, Tony had awoken in his childhood bedroom with an idea for an article fully formed in his mind. Robert Lemoyne was one of dozens, maybe hundreds, of super-rich survivalists buying bolt holes in New Zealand for the end of days. Tony would investigate them all. He drew the line at going undercover. The Burnham Wood Group were his friends, at least they used to be, and he wouldn't openly deceive them. But it was a free country, and there was nothing to stop him from planning a little camping trip down to Thorndike, and if he stumbled on something while he was down there, well, there would be nothing to stop him from investigating it and reporting, purely in the public interest, what he found. He felt his phone buzz. It was a notification that a new document had been added to the shared folder Burnham Wood by the user Shelley Noakes. The file was headed Schedule 1606 Corowai Pass Road and it comprised a roster of tasks to be completed, a planting programme and a hand-drawn map of the farm. Tony scrutinised it carefully. He could see an airstrip near the top of the property, but there was no reference to a potential building site, and so he opened his browser and called up the local council's database. Le Moyne would need resource consent to build, and if Tony was in luck, then the plans for the bunker might be accessible online. He wasted over an hour in fruitless navigation before he found any planning permission associated with 1606 Corowai Pass Road, but it was only a subdivision permit, 
and it had been granted to Owen and Jill Darvish in November of the previous year. They must be the people who had sold Lemoyne the farm. Searching their names, Tony was directed to the glut of news articles about the recent knighthood, establishment incarnate, he thought cynically. But to his surprise, the real estate listing for 1606 Corowai Pass Road had been taken down. He called up the land records database and submitted a request to view the title certificate to the property, paying a $5 fee for the privilege. He finally traipsed downstairs a little after one o'clock. You were late in last night, his mother said as he opened the refrigerator. Was it a good meeting? His sister, Veronica, was on her way into the kitchen. Where? she said. At Burnham Wood, said his mother. You weren't at Burnham Wood last night, said Veronica, laughing. You were at the Fox and Ferret making out with Rosie Damani. Hamish Locust saw you, he texted me. You told me you had a meeting, said his mother. I did have a meeting, said Tony, and I basically got expelled, so I went to the pub to have a drink, and I saw Rosie Damani, and I guess I forgot I was living in Stasi East Germany in 1984. Tony had left the hooey feeling comprehensively humiliated. An hour later, Rosie had tapped him on the shoulder in the bar of the Fox and Ferret, the evening had passed pleasantly enough. She had seemed impressed when he described his intentions for his essay, and they'd kissed. But when she expressed remorse that he was heading down to Thorndyke, it was such bad timing, she said. Tony realised, with total guilty clarity, that it was simply never going to work between them. Veronica held out a mug of coffee. Sorry, she said. I was just giving you shit. Thanks, he said, taking the mug. Then, hey, Ronica, can I borrow your car? Tony arrived in Thorndyke late the next day and parked next to the visitor's centre. The first task he had set himself was to find out the tail number of Lemoyne's plane. His plan was to head into the National Park on the track that led up to a good vantage point over the Darvish farm, and to that end, he'd purchased a pair of binoculars, amusing himself with the imagined cover story, should he need one, that he was a birder looking for the famous orange-fronted parakeet. He shouldered his backpack and set off into the park until he reached the base of a stony outcrop. He could hear a distant roar that must be the wind in the valley. It couldn't be a river or a waterfall, because he knew that there was nothing of the kind nearby. In the ferny undergrowth in front of him, he saw a chain-link fence with a plastic sign that read, Research in progress, please keep out. Tony peered through the fence, but he could see no clues as to what kind of research was being carried out beyond it. He diverted his course uphill, and presently came over a little rise to find a trailer-mounted phone mast. A second trailer, a mobile home, was parked behind it, and sitting on the step, smoking a cigarette, was a burly man in his forties wearing a green zipped-up fleece. He saw Tony and stood up at once. Cura, said Tony. Hi there, said the man with trepidation. He flicked a cigarette away. Tony nodded at the trailer. Bit of a job driving that up here. Yeah, said the man. His accent was either American or Canadian. You must really need the signal, Tony said. I guess somebody does. The research there, Tony said after a pause. Is it? Yeah. Geophysics, said the man. Radiometric survey. Oh, right. Tony said, like radioactive. Don't ask me, said the man. I'm just security. Tony couldn't think of anything else to say. Well, have a good one. You too, said the man. They exchanged a nod. Tony turned and had just set off again when something caught his eye. Clinging to the signal tower was a small, slender parakeet with a yellow crown and a distinctive orange band above its beak. 
Tony stopped in his tracks. Holy shit, he said, turning back to point the creature out. And then he froze. For in the few seconds that his back had been turned, the man had silently unzipped his fleece, and he was now putting his right hand into his left armpit, as if reaching for a gun. They stared at each other. What? said the man, not moving. Tony's heart was pounding. Parakeet, he said. He pointed at the bird. Super endangered. There's only like 60 of them left. The man's eyes moved to the bird. It cocked its head, hopped off the signal tower and ducked out of sight. He looked again at Tony. His hand was still in his armpit. His eyes were narrowed. Well, see ya, Tony said, and turned away and disappeared into the trees. Had he just imagined it? A flash of brown leather inside the guy's fleece? A suggestion of a holster? The harder Tony tried to picture it, the more ludicrous it seemed. Of course he had only imagined it. This was New Zealand, for heaven's sake. People didn't carry guns. He just spooked himself. Feeling foolish, Tony quickened his pace. He came over a bank of ferns and arrived at a stock wire fence that he guessed must mark the upper boundary of the Darvish property. He proceeded along it, and soon he spied a forlorn-looking windsock at the end of a wide, level terrace that could only be the airstrip. He came to a halt, disappointed. The plane wasn't there. Tony spent the rest of the day in reconnaissance, tramping up above the tree line, and was just considering where the nearest place to refill his water bottles might be when a light aircraft whined directly overhead. The plane banked over the Darvish farm and then dropped out of sight behind the trees. Tony hurried after it. He arrived at the fence about 15 minutes later, panting slightly, to see that the plane had landed and the pilot was nowhere to be seen. But Tony was elated, for the registration mark on the tail was clearly legible from where he stood. He took his fountain pen out of his pocket and wrote the letters on the back of his hand. Zulu, Kilo, Charlie, Uniform, Oscar. He watched the plane for almost an hour and was rewarded for his patience when a man in a dark tracksuit finally strolled up the hill and into view. It could only be Lemoyne. At his side was Mira, and they appeared to be deep in conversation. After ten minutes or so, they seemed to reach an agreement, for they shook hands and said goodbye. Mira headed back downhill, and Lemoyne returned to the plane and climbed back into the cockpit. Tony made a gun out of his index finger and his thumb, aimed it at the billionaire, and pulled the trigger. Pow! He whispered. Back in the visitor centre car park, Tony plugged in his laptop and sat in the car exploring the website of New Zealand's Civil Aviation Authority. He discovered that the plane Lemoyne was flying, registration mark ZKCUO, was owned by an aero club near Queenstown. Open source flight logs showed that it had landed at the Darvish farm more than a dozen times over the past few months alone. His phone buzzed, startling him. He looked down to see he'd received a text message. Rosie had sent two emojis, a gun followed by a cigarette. Then she wrote, oh, wait, and sent them again the other way, first the cigarette and then the gun. Smoking gun, she wrote in explanation, because I really hope you find one. Tony didn't smile. Funny you should say that, he typed then. I might be out of range for a few days, just FYI. Following a hunch before hitting send. Amazing, she wrote, and then, mysterious, and then, be careful. BBC Sounds, music, radio, podcasts. Tony camped by the lake overnight and woke on Monday morning to find an email waiting in his inbox. It was a title certificate for 1606 Corowai Path Road that he'd requested. 
and he opened the attachment to discover that the title was held by Jill and Owen Darvish, as it had been since May 2012. Tony sat up in his sleeping bag, frowning. If the land hadn't legally changed hands, then he had no story. What kind of survivalist would build a bunker on a property that belonged to someone else? That would defeat the whole purpose, surely. His phone started ringing, making him jump. He picked it up. Anthony? Owen Darvish, said a loud, thickly accented voice in his ear. Oh, wow. Hello, Tony said. Just responding to your email, Sir Owen said. You said you were writing an article? Yeah, uh, hang on, let me just get my... Tony scrabbled around to find his dictaphone. Yeah, I'm writing a piece about Robert Lemoyne. He put his phone on speaker and clicked record. And I wanted to ask you if you sold him your property in Thorndike. There was a little silence. Then Sir Owen said, Anthony, I'm sure you know already that my company's in business with Autonomo. I'm not sure what you're trying to achieve here, mate. Tony felt a spike of excitement. For if he'd been on the wrong track altogether, then Sir Owen would surely have denied it out of hand. So you do confirm the sale has taken place? Look, Anthony, I want to know who you've been talking to, Sir Owen said. Where have you got this from? I can't reveal my sources, I'm afraid, Tony said. Then I'm not interested in giving interviews, sorry. Actually, Tony said quickly, I'm in Thorndike right now. I've got a good view over your farm from up on the ridge there. Amazing position. I've been looking at the flight log of a plane that's made quite a few trips to Thorndike recently. Registration mark, Zulu, Kilo, Charlie, Uniform Oscar. Does that ring any bells? Sir Owen made an irritated noise. I've got nothing to tell you, Anthony. You're wasting your time. Just one more question, Tony said. It's about a radiometric survey project. The line went quiet. Then Sir Owen said, What? The radiometric survey site, up near the pass, above the landslide. I spoke to a security guard, Tony said. He said it was something involving radiometric. Security guard where? said Sir Owen. On the Korowai National Park, Tony said, right behind your back fence. There was a mobile phone tower and a fence around. Sorry, mate, I think we've got our wires crossed somewhere, Sir Owen said loudly. Thanks anyway. And before Tony could say anything else, he had hung up. Mira fetched her irrigation backpack and her long-handled hoe and went up the northern fence line to check the crop she'd sown about a month ago when she'd been camping on her own. Though this was mostly a pretext, she wanted to be alone with her thoughts for a while. Mira had not been entirely honest in her pitch to Burnham Wood. She had decided to leave certain details out, The Darvishes, for example, who, as far as she knew, had no idea what was going on at the farm behind their backs. Lemoyne had told her that he did not yet own the land outright, but so far had only put down a deposit. She had reasoned to herself that, after all, it was only a partial deception, since the Darvishes had given Lemoyne full use of the farm in their absence, including the farmhouse, and had encouraged him to make himself at home, Whether this hospitality would extend to Burnham Wood, of course, was doubtful, but when she raised the issue with Lemoyne, he had only shrugged and smiled and said he thought she called herself an anarchist. Surely the danger was part of the appeal. Mira knew that a large proportion of the world's billionaires were psychopaths, and she also knew that one defining feature of psychopathy was a tendency to lie. It was possible that Lemoyne had never even met the Darvishes. Maybe he was trespassing as well. Maybe he wanted to acquire Burnham Wood in order to destroy it. Or he might be grooming her for something else entirely. Or he might be trying to frame her. Or he might be simply toying with her as a joke. He might be sick in the head. He might be planning to kill her. He might be planning to kill the whole group. But the only person who Mira knew for sure had lied to Burnham Wood about the Darvish farm was her. There were seven of them living at the farm for now. Hayden Mickey and Katrina Hunt, both actors. Aaron Chang was a playwright. Natalie Ormerson had just finished a PhD in anthropology. And Jessica Barrett, a visual artist, 
who was currently writing advertising copy, which she could do remotely from the farm. Mira had told them that the house was strictly out of bounds, explaining that Burnham Wood was being auditioned as a fully self-sufficient enterprise. They pitched their tents inside the shearing shed, cooked with bottled gas, and after several days of roughing it, politely voted in favour of hiring an eco-toilet and a cold-water camp shower. Mira felt a pang to think of the Darvish bathroom, empty and unused, just up the hill, but she had cast her vote along with the majority and held her tongue. When she reached the terrace, Mira proceeded up along the rows of baby beets and spinach, wielding the irrigation wand in one hand and hoeing with the other. And as she worked, her mind drifted back to the day she dug the furrow, the day after her first encounter with Lemoyne, in fact, when, late in the morning, she had heard engine noise and looked up to see his aircraft cresting the Korowai Ranges. The plane had passed out of sight over the treetops, and a short while later he had appeared in person over the brow of the hill, making his way down the field towards her on foot. She had bowed her head and kept digging, but he would walked right up to her and sat down in the dirt, and she caught a faint current of his aftershave with notes of fennel and pepper. She turned and looked at him. So, Burnham Wood, he had said when their eyes met. Tell me everything there is to tell. Start at the beginning and don't leave anything out. She squinted at him. Why? Well, he said, because I've never seen an organization quite like yours before, and I think it has potential. And on a personal level, because I like your gumption. I find it appealing. And what's the real reason? The Moyne burst out laughing. Okay, you're right, he said cheerfully. I do have a real reason, and here it is. A few months ago, I made Owen Darvish an offer on his farm. I asked him and his wife to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Owen Darvish chose to interpret that request selectively because that's the kind of puffed-up little prick he is. He figured out that as long as he didn't mention me by name, he could talk about his pet project all he liked without violating the terms of the NDA. He had his cake, and he ate it right in front of me. That makes me well disposed towards anyone who's stealing from him. There. Mira looked away. She was determined not to let him see how reassured she felt that he was laughing. Her father had given her a copy of the psychopath test one Christmas, and she had a hazy memory that one of the items on the checklist was an inability to laugh. But being charming was definitely a sign, a very bad one, and Lemoyne was nothing if not charming. She could feel herself becoming very seriously charmed. Lady Darvish set two plates of fettuccine down on the table. Sir Owen looked down at his meal without seeming to see it. It doesn't make any sense, he said. Anthony starts on about this top-secret research site up in Korowa. He specifically said the word radiometric. There's palm in that bowl there, Lady Darvish said. Owen picked up the bowl automatically and spooned some out. But there wouldn't be an on-the-ground testing site for that, he said. Because nowadays, they do it all from the air. They use high-flying drones. That's the autonomo connection. And the government did a survey of the whole country back in 2010, magnetic and radiometric both. The report's now online. Anyone can look it up. Can I have the parmesan, please? He passed it to her. I looked up the report this afternoon. I thought that they might have found something like a uranium deposit or lithium or even gold. or I don't know. So... I looked up Korowa, and guess what we're sitting on down there? Diamonds, said Lady Darvish. He didn't smile. Just rocks, he said. Three kinds of rocks, that's it. Limestone, granite, and don't tell me, she thought about it. My dad would have known this. Slate? Schist, Sir Owen said. Limestone, granite, and schist. It's so ordinary, there's nothing there. He shook his head. Anthony said he'd been up on the ridge and he explicitly said that he'd talked to a security guard at the research site, 
in the National Park. All right, so maybe there is something there, but it's just something to do with the slip, said Lady Darvish. Earthquake strengthening, right? Some structural engineering type of thing. Sir Owen seemed to waver. But then why would he say radiometric? If she hadn't known her husband better, Lady Darvish thought sardonically, she might have suspected that Sir Owen Patrick Darvish had a crush. In the billionaire's presence, he was both fawning and strutting, both unnaturally macho and unnaturally sycophantic. He was intensely proud of having courted foreign wealth and proving that New Zealanders could hold their own among the world's elite. At the same time, however, he desperately wanted to see the man cut down to size. This business about the radiometric survey, for instance. If Sir Owen still had misgivings, he should have just spoken to Le Moyne directly. But the call had flustered him. It had convinced him that he'd missed something, that he'd been bested somehow, even hoodwinked, not by Anthony, by Le Moyne. Sir Owen put down his fork. I'm booking a flight down to Christchurch, he said. What for? she said. I want to see this research site for myself. She gaped at him. What? Down in Korowai? Yeah, he said. I rent a car at the airport and drive down. It's just Friday night to Sunday night, he said. In and out. Be good to check on the house anyway. But all that driving, Lady Darvish said. You'll spend the whole time in the car. She glared at him with helpless annoyance. What about Robert, she said. We said we'd let him know if we were coming back. He might be there. Sir Owen scoffed. Jill, please. He was never going to stay at our house. I think he's probably got better places to be. She detected bitterness. What is it that you think you're going to find down there exactly? If I knew that, I wouldn't be going down, he said. Would I? BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. To Le Moyne's intense irritation, it had turned out that the world's last remaining populations of the orange-fronted parakeet could be found almost exclusively in the Korowai National Park, which was the last place on Earth that he wanted to invite Owen Darvish's conservation project. He had been considering drastically changing course when, in the weeks after the Queen's birthday announcement, the Darvishes had invited him for dinner at their house, and the wife had leaned tipsily across the table and confided that actually her husband had never even seen an orange-fronted parakeet. He didn't want to seem disloyal to the Korowai region, that was all. The knighthood meant he had to show that he hadn't forgotten where he came from. It was a Kiwi thing. She'd whispered not to worry. She'd speak to Owen and bring him round. And all Le Moyne could think was if he had ever caught his wife talking in this way behind his back, he'd have killed her. Several days later, Le Moyne had received an updated version of the contract with all mention of the orange-fronted parakeet removed. The New Zealand fairy tern was suggested as a substitute endangered species. It was a frail, sand-nesting seabird that could be found only in the province of Northland, a safe 600 miles away. At long last, the deal was done. The night before Sir Owen's conservation project was to launch, Le Moyne boarded a commercial flight to San Francisco and flew home. Fourteen hours later, he was back in his Palo Alto office, undergoing intravenous rehydration while he scrolled through a backlog of correspondence. It was almost nine in the evening, local time, when he heard his phone buzzing. He detached the IV drip and answered it. Sir, said a distant sounding voice on the other end, we've just had our second security beach in a week. Target is a white male, brown hair, beard, medium height, maybe 30 years of age, red jacket, black shorts. Possibly someone from Burnham Wood, thought Lemoyne. 
He moved his keyboard, entered the Korowai operating system as a remote user, and accessed all cameras. The screen in front of him split into four, and then eight, and then twelve. He selected the feed over the shearing shed and enlarged it, swiftly counting heads. What else? He was first sighted on Saturday morning at ten hundred hours, said the voice. He engaged in small talk. He moved on, nothing to arouse suspicion. Lemoyne had counted seven people, everyone accounted for. But then he came back, he said. Yes, sir. He was sighted again today at 1440 hours, near extraction point NE4. He was carrying binoculars. So there was reason for suspicion, said Lemoyne. You just missed it. Where is he now, soldier? There was a pause, and then the voice said, We don't know, sir. You lost him. Sir, with respect, don't give me respect, snapped Lemoyne. Respect is doing your job. He hung up. It was pretty irritating, he thought, that the only way of getting a job done to his satisfaction was if he did every little part of it himself. Tony heard the drone before he saw it, a distant rushing noise, rather like the sound inside a seashell, it was the same sound he'd heard on his first day out in the wilderness that he'd taken for a waterfall, and it seemed to be growing louder as he picked his way down the mountainside. He was just wondering if he ought to get out his phone and try for a signal when he emerged onto a little bluff with views out over the Korowai Basin, and he saw, sweeping back and forth over the treetops, a sleek-looking quadcopter drone. He stood watching it fly for almost a minute. The drone was barely 50 metres up, it looked like it was methodically combing the area for something. Presently, he blinked and saw another. And then he realised all at once that the basin was absolutely swarming with them, all moving independently of one another, some dipping down into the trees and up again, others hovering in place. Tony set down his backpack and took out his binoculars for a closer look. His attention snagged on something in the middle of his field of view, and he raised the lenses to his eyes to see a drone hanging in the air right in front of him, startlingly magnified, propellers thrumming. Tony had no doubt whatsoever that the machine had seen him, that it was seeing him, assessing him, in real time. His heart was thumping, but he kept the binoculars to his eyes and calmly panned away, moving slowly, acting as though he hadn't noticed anything unusual. He put the binoculars back in his bag, shouldered his backpack, and ambled off into the bush until the noise of the drones behind him began to fall away. Then, not daring to look back, he broke into a run, moving as fast as he could, scrambling over roots and fallen trees. After half a kilometre or so, he turned sharply to his left, doubling back on himself, then altered his course again into the heart of the Korowai Basin. He was scanning for shelter as he went, and presently he came upon a fallen totara tree. He ducked underneath, rolled onto his stomach and lay motionless until his breathing returned to normal, and he was satisfied he hadn't been pursued. Then, moving as quietly and as efficiently as he could, he opened his backpack and took out his balaclava and a pair of over-trousers. He put these on, then pulled on a pair of woolen gloves as well. He knew that the drone's thermal imaging technology would have a harder time detecting him through insulated clothing. Then he took off his red jacket and exchanged it for a darker-coloured fleece, tucking the hem of the fleece into the waistband of his trousers. Every inch of his body was now covered, except for the slot over his eyes. They were looking for him. They were on the alert. Better to wait a day or two, he thought. Let them think he'd left the area. Then undertake a spot of surveillance of his own. Mira lifted up the tendrils of a strawberry plant to pour a dilution of tomato food into the soil. As Shelley knelt to disperse loose straw over the ground, the sound of an aircraft engine split the air, and she looked up to see that Mira had downed her tools and was already striding up the hill towards the airstrip. Wait for me, Shelley called out, pulling off her gloves. The plane had landed and taxied to a halt by the time they reached the airstrip, and Le Moyne was getting out. I've been in California, he said by way of a greeting. I brought you something. 
He took a Ziploc bag out of his pocket and held it up so they could see what it contained. A tiny piece of watercolour paper, barely bigger than a bus ticket, divided into squares like a miniature loyalty card. Each square had been stamped with a turquoise five-pointed star. Shelley didn't know what it was. Mira was already shaking her head and holding up both hands. No thanks, she said. Not for me. Lemoyne grinned. It's a housewarming present, he said, passing the bag to Shelley instead. I'm going to stay over. I thought we could all sample some of this together. Everyone should try acid once. We use it all the time with stirrups and as a kind of bonding exercise. So that's what it was, thought Shelley. Acid. It's amazing what it does to the imagination, said Lemoyne. Even just a taste. It makes you more present, you know, more creative. You're going to love it, he said, gazing at her. Shelley, right? Yeah, Shelley said, astonished. It's for everyone, he said. Socialism. See? I get it. He went back to the cockpit to retrieve an aluminium cooler. I've brought dinner, he said when he re-emerged. Vegetarian pad thai. Shelley, why don't you take that down to the camp and round up the others? Tell them we'll be down in just a moment. He was giving her the brush off, but he touched her arm as he spoke and smiled. Shelley set off down the hill towards the shearing shed. Mira was already regretting having taken such a hard line on the LSD. But you don't even drink coffee, she said. Lemoyne grinned at her. I must say, I never picked you for a Puritan, he said. Well, I guess not everybody is a total cliché, Mira snapped. He grinned wider. Being a cliché can be very useful. It means people underestimate you. They reveal themselves. You know we've actually been working pretty hard here, Mira said. So maybe before you drop your tab of acid tonight, we could actually draw up a contract or something, just so we can be sure you're not stringing us along. You're right, he said. I have been stringing you along. She faltered, not understanding. This is a rare experience for me, said Lemoyne. This. He gestured at the space between them. I've been wanting to enjoy it. Draw it out. But yes. Let's get something down in writing. Good idea. Mira was blushing now. She felt that she had misjudged him, that she had failed to trust him, that she was in the wrong. Abruptly, he said, I changed the code on the front gate. What? She said, when? This morning, he said. It's now 7172. I added one to every digit. Hey, she said in a tone of offence. It's lucky we didn't need the van today. We'd have been locked out. 7172, he said again. Should be easy to remember. It's kind of weird you changed it before telling us, she said, when we're the ones living here. He stared at her for a moment without blinking. Then he said, When my wife died, Mira, I had paparazzi at my front gate for a year. If I came out of my house, if I even opened a window, they'd yell at me. You knew about that helicopter, didn't you? They'd say. Was it murder? Or was it sabotage? Every allegation was utterly false and utterly obscene, but they were trying to make me angry, because if I react, that's their story. But they're not breaking any laws. They're only asking questions. That's their job. They even used to say, is it true she's still alive? How cruel is that? To a man whose wife is dead. Mira was appalled. God, she said. I'm so sorry, that's horrendous. So, I have to take certain precautions. She was blushing again. Yeah, she said, of course. And when Burnham Wood goes live, he shrugged. Well, 
I've been enjoying this, our little back and forth, and the privacy, but you're right. It's got to be about the work. He smiled at her a little sadly and gestured down the hill. Shall we head down? He had never spoken of his wife to her before. He had never spoken about any of his relatives, in fact, or any of his associates or any of his friends. Perhaps he was starting to trust her, Mira thought, as they set off down the slope. She felt a surge of pity for him, and then shame that she had endured nothing in her own life that could possibly compare with what he had gone through. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. The sun was setting by the time Mira and Lemoyne reached the shearing shed, where they found Aaron and Jessica lighting hurricane lanterns and Hayden chopping kindling for a fire. The ingredients for the pad thai had been lined up next to the barbecue, and inside the shed, Shally and Katrina and Natalie were setting the table for dinner. It was an old door they'd propped on a pair of oil drums, with mismatched crockery laid around a homemade centrepiece of toy toy and harakeke flowers. I like what you've done with the place, said Lemoyne, smiling. Probably a bit posher than you used to, Shelley said, but hey. It occurred to Mira that she was flirting with him. We were just talking about your costume parties, Natalie said. Mira wasn't following. What are you talking about? Uh, it's a tradition at Autonomo, explained Lemoyne. We have a themed costume party every year at Halloween. He turned back to the others. Last year, the theme was Rubik's Cube, he said. You come wearing six items in all the colours of the sides of the Rubik's Cube, and the rule is that by the end of the night, you have to be dressed in all one colour. Oh my God, said Shelley, that's so good. She was flirting with him, and now she was avoiding Mira's gaze. Hey man, said Aaron to Lemoyne, Thanks for the acid, by the way. To Meke. To Meke, said Lemoyne. To Meke is like, uh, thanks, in the sense of, you didn't have to do that above and beyond. Mira's going to sit it out, Shelley said suddenly, her voice loud and brittle. But is everybody else keen? It seemed that everybody was. Shelley produced the Ziploc bag, and they began to discuss dosages and timing and what kinds of effects they could expect. Not for me, said Lemoyne. I'm going to keep Mira company. Over dinner, Shelley said nothing at all. It was only when they all began to laugh one by one around the table that Mira realised that the acid must be starting to take effect. And then Lemoyne caught her eye and made a movement with his head that meant, let's get out of here. And Mira felt her stomach drop. Dumbly, she got up from the table and left. Lemoyne followed her out into the darkness and around the vanette, which was parked at an angle to provide a windbreak for the barbecue. Afterwards, she could not remember if she had taken his hand or if he had taken hers. The farmhouse was dark and cold, God damn it, said Lemoyne, as he let them in with the key. I forgot that nobody has central heating in this country. He went to find the controls for the heat pump. Mira moved to the window and looked out into the dark. Then she froze. There was a car at the gate. Its lights were off and she couldn't tell if anyone was inside. But from the way it was parked close to the keypad... It appeared as if the driver had pulled in, meaning to input the code and enter. Robert, she said, there's someone at the gate. In an instant, he was at her side. You changed the code, she said. He got his phone out. Someone tried the intercom 20 minutes ago. But where are they now? Did they come over the gate? In the next instant, 
Mira heard the roar of an engine revving painfully in a low gear, and then the vanette came careening past the house and down the hill. Lemoyne was already running out of the room. Mira heard a thud and a screech of tyres. She followed Lemoyne out of the house and saw that the vanette had swerved off the gravel drive and crashed into a tree. She saw Shelley stepping down from the driver's seat, looking utterly bewildered, and in the red wash of the tail lights, she saw a body lying in the drive, a man, unmoving, pelvis twisted, one arm flung out. And she broke into a run, but before she was close enough to recognise him, before Lemoyne pulled her sharply back, folding her tight against his chest, before Shelley sank to her knees and made a strangled sound, before she was even sure that the man was really dead, she knew, with sick, guilty, hideous conviction, that it was Owen Darvish, that Owen Darvish had unexpectedly come home. Jill Darvish had last spoken with her husband when he landed at Christchurch and picked up a rental car to make the journey south. The next morning, she was a little miffed to see that he hadn't sent a text to say that he'd got in safe. But then again, he'd probably gone straight to bed when he arrived. Her phone buzzed, and she took it out to see a call from the landline at the Thorndyke house. Hello, love, she said. How was the drive? But it wasn't Sir Owen. It was Lemoyne. Jill, he said, it's Robert. Sorry to trouble you. I'm trying to reach your husband. Lady Darvish felt a heart clutch in her chest. He's there, she said. He's at the house. Yeah, I was waiting for him, Lemoyne said. He emailed a few days ago to tell me he was coming down, but I guess my reply got stuck in my draft somehow, and I didn't notice till this morning. Sorry to bother you. I just thought he might have changed his plans because I didn't reply to his email. I tried calling a cell just now, but it's off. But he's at the house, said Lady Darvish again. He drove down last night. There was a pause. Then Lemoyne said, No, Jill, he's not here. But where could he be? Her voice was getting high and tight. Something's happened. Let's not jump to conclusions, said Lemoyne. We could try to locate his phone. Oh, but no, we'd need his Gmail password. I know it, she said. You do, Lemoyne said, sounding surprised. Well, fantastic. Go to your computer and Google Find My Device. It took only seven seconds to return a result. Oh, she said. He's in Thorndyke. Well, that's good said Lemoyne. What's a time stamp? 23.32, she said. Last night. No, this can't be right. It says he was up at the lookout. What's the lookout? said Lemoyne. On the road up to the pass, there's a lookout over the lake. Neither of them spoke for a moment. Then he said, Do you want me to drive up and see? Would you? she said in a flood of relief. Oh, Robert, it's very kind of you to take the trouble. Let's find him first, said Lemoyne. After she'd hung up, she checked Sir Owen's email and saw one unread message from Robert Lemoyne sent barely an hour ago. Owen, apologies. Thought I'd sent this days ago. R. Hi, Owen. Congrats on the launch. As you know, I'm in California this week, but let's meet at your place this weekend. I'm liking what I'm seeing from the Burnham crew, and I think we should progress to next steps. Talk soon. Robert. Lady Darvish was frowning. Who were the Burnham crew? She typed the word Burnham into her search engine, but all that came up was Shakespeare's Macbeth and, closer to home, a Facebook page for some kind of gardening society in Christchurch that appeared to go by the name of Burnham Wood. The photos showed thriving residential gardens, boxes of seasonal produce, smiling young people in their twenties and thirties. An old saying popped into her head, that there were two things that would always be believed of any man, and one of them was that he'd taken to drink. But not Owen, she thought. She drummed her fingernails against the desk. Sir Owen had said the so-called journalist Anthony was down in Thorndyke. All right, 
Well, perhaps they were together now. Perhaps they'd gone up to the lookout together for some reason. She retrieved Anthony's number from his email and dialed. Hi, you've reached Tony. You know what to do. Cheers, said the recorded voice in her ear. Tony, hi. Jill Darvish here, she said. You spoke with my husband Owen about a piece you were writing? Yeah, he's come down to Thorndyke to talk to you and I'm trying to reach him. I thought you might be together, or maybe you might know where he is. Anyway, give me a call back, she said, and then she left her own number and hung up. The landline shrilled out in the kitchen, making her jump. She ran to answer it. Hello, she gasped. It was Lemoyne. Jill, it's Robert, he said, his voice seeming heavier now. I don't know how to tell you this. And that was the last thing she heard. Lemoyne had started strategizing from the moment he'd seen the body. It was a bad situation. Even if Darvish's death could be made to seem purely like an accident, there was no getting around the fact that the Burnham crew were squatting at the farm at Lemoyne's invitation, and, as Mira's bank records could prove, on Lemoyne's dollar. Once all of that got out, Jill Darvish wouldn't just back out of the sale. Very probably she would litigate against him. And what would happen to the extraction site in Korowai, and the mercenaries, and all their processing equipment, and the rare earth motherload itself? No, Lemoyne thought. He couldn't risk Jill Darvish finding out the truth, which meant the truth was going to have to change. Abruptly, Lemoyne let go of Mira and went over to the body. In Darvish's left trouser pocket, he could see a flat rectangle, his phone. He knelt down and eased it out. Who's that man? Shelley said. Is he dead? Don't worry, said Lemoyne. He isn't real. None of this is real. It's a simulation. I'll explain it at the end. Now go and sit in the van. He shut the door on her and looked at Mira. She doesn't know, Mira said. About the Darvishes, none of them do. The tears were coursing down her cheeks. We should call the police, she said. Mira, said Lemoyne. We'll call the police. Just not until we're ready, all right? I can take care of it. But we're in this together. Do you understand? She nodded at the ground. He went back to Darvish's body and pressed the man's thumbprint to the phone sensor button. He erased Darvish's movements over the past half hour and then disabled the location service temporarily. Then he took his own phone out of his pocket. It was simple enough to make an email appear as though it had been sent and received some time ago. With a few keystrokes, Lemoyne could make it seem as though Darvish had known about Burnham Wood from the beginning. He tapped away, holding his own phone in one hand and the dead man's in the other. We need to get him down to the gate and put him back in his SUV, he said. Do you think you can do that? Mira nodded again. They knelt on either side of Darvish and lugged him into the four-wheel drive. They put him back in the driver's seat, first dusting him down for any gravel that might have caught in his clothing. Mira reminded him to change the gate code back to what it used to be. Go back and be with Shelley. Lemoyne said to her. I can take it from here. Go. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Shelley must have drifted off, because the next thing she knew it was dawn and she was in the back of the van. She opened her eyes to see what appeared to be a stuccoed single-storey house. She could see a mossy drain pipe and a frosted bathroom window. She saw the ridge of the Korowai Ranges high above her and realised that they were in the back streets of Thorndyke. Then the rear doors of the van were thrown open and there was Mira still dressed in the jeans and patched woolen sweater she'd been wearing the previous day. They stared at each other. Where are we? 
Shelley said. She sat up, peering out over Mira's shoulder, all the colours soft and liquid in the early morning winter light. And for a brief second, she allowed herself to hope that the stranger in the driveway had only been a simulation after all. She turned to look over her shoulder at the windscreen, but it was cracked all the way across. Mira rounded on her furiously. What were you doing in the van, she said. You dropped a tab of acid and then, what, you thought you'd go for a joyride in the middle of the night, alone? What is wrong with you? Where were you even going? I got an interview, Shelley said. I applied for this job at the charity services last month when you went away. They emailed yesterday to say I've been shortlisted. Mira's face was taut with rage. What are you talking about, Shelley? It wasn't a joyride, Shelley said. Last night, I was leaving. I mean, I am leaving. I'm leaving Burnham Wood, OK? This is me telling you I'm out. Are you insane? Mira said. Shelley tried to laugh. I mean, obviously I'll pay for the damage. I totally had no right to take your van, but actually, to be honest, maybe it was a good thing I crashed, you know. I mean, I might have really hurt someone. Her voice was getting higher and higher and she felt that she might be on the verge of hysterics. Stop it, Mira said. I have to tell you something. Okay, said Shelley. Sure. Mira's head was bowed. Robert hasn't bought the farm yet. He's put down a deposit. It's going to happen. They just haven't quite closed on all the contractual stuff. The owner, Mira took a ragged breath, the owner's name is Owen Darvish. Shelley nodded. I was going to tell you, Mira said, at the hui, but I guess I forgot to mention it. I didn't know he was coming home, she said, nor did Robert. And the gate, Robert changed, I mean, there was something wrong with the gate. So I guess he, he climbed over. Shelley was still nodding. Jesus, Shelley, Mira burst out. You killed somebody, all right? You killed a man, and Robert's out there right now cleaning it up. So just snap out of it. You are like this close to going to jail for the rest of your life. Do you understand that? So where is Robert? Shelley said carefully. He said it was better if we didn't know, Mira said. This house belongs to a friend of his. We're just supposed to wait here, and I think someone's going to come and fix the van. But he said he's going to sort everything out. He's going to tell the others that he staged an intervention, told us to go away for a few days and have it out, like just one-on-one, -on -one, for the good of the group. Mira's phone started buzzing in her hand, startling her. The screen showed an incoming call from a blocked number. She swiped to accept the call. It's Robert, said Lemoyne. How are you? I'm OK, Mira said, feeling a lump in her throat suddenly. How's Shelley doing? Not great? Flipping out a bit? She shut her eyes tight. Robert? How did he die? Lemoyne sucked in a breath and then expelled it very slowly. He drove up to the barricade, he said. He got out of the car and walked around a bit and then got back in again. From the tyre tracks, it would seem that he then tried to make a three-point turn to head back home, but he cut too wide, and the car went past the end of the guardrail and over the cliff. It rolled a couple of times on the way down, and the fuel line was damaged, so by the time he was found, which wasn't until this morning, everything was pretty badly burned. We don't know why he drove up there. We don't know why he lost control of the car. But there was nobody up there last night, no sign of struggle. And he had no enemies to speak of, so I can't see they'll have any reason to investigate. Mira's eyes were still shut. What about Burnham Wood? I don't see how that's relevant. The sat-nav on the car will show that he never made it home. He's never had any contact with any of you before. There's now a paper trail to show that he was coming down to meet with you this morning. But we were all at the farm last night, and he wasn't. 
seems pretty straightforward to me. Okay, Mira said. She opened her eyes. Shelley was staring at her. Is that Robert? she said. Mira nodded. Tell him we want a million, Shelley said. A hundred grand isn't enough. There was quiet. Did you hear that? Mira whispered. Yes, said Lemoyne. And then the line went dead. Lemoyne was smiling now. He had been entirely wrong about Shelley Noakes. He had taken her for a dog's body, a beta fish, a bridesmaid, a ride along. He had looked right past her, as likely many people did. He saw now how wrong he'd been. Shelley possessed a ruthlessness that Mira simply lacked. Shelley had seen a chance to capitalize, and she had seized it. Shelley was the asset here. Shelley was the one he could use. It was late, but Lemoyne sent an email instructing his PA in Palo Alto to courier a file of paperwork to the Darvish farm as soon as possible, with the envelope made out to Shelley Noakes. They were going to have to earn that million. He was going to drown them in five-year plans and vision statements and incorporation papers. His third phone started ringing in his duffel bag. He fished it out and listened for a minute. His free hand clenched into a fist. Then he said, Where? And then, How long ago? Then he hung up. Tony had breached the fence in Korowai two days ago. He couldn't put a name to most of what he found there, but he knew environmental devastation when he saw it. He'd taken photographs of everything. The vast sheets of camouflage-style netting spread over the ground, which could surely have no scientific purpose other than concealment, and which he'd lifted up to see dozens, maybe hundreds, of manhole covers sunk into the ground, and beyond them, piles of PVC piping, coiled hoses, empty drums. Everywhere the plants were dead or dying, husks of dead insects crunching underfoot, even dead birds, riflemen, wax eyes, fantails, keraroo, some still plump and glassy, others desiccated and flattened with decay. When he'd used up his roll of film, the last thing he did before he left the area was to try to shift one of the manhole covers aside so that he could see what lay beneath it. It was very heavy, but when he braced himself, it moved. He slid it aside and saw a cylindrical borehole drilled into the bedrock. The hole was filled to the brim with an evil-smelling chemical solution that had made his stomach rise into his throat. He recalled it now as he got into the driver's seat of Veronica's car and shut the door. The government must have begun mining the country's national parks in secret, illegally, immorally, without environmental oversight, and, given the Autonomo connection, in collusion with a foreign company to boot. It was conspiracy and corruption at the highest level. It was an offence against democracy. It was treason. Aloud, Tony said, Jesus Christ. Then, hushed, in wonderment, he said, I am going to be so famous. The nearest town was about an hour's drive away. He'd treat himself to a night in a motel, he thought, somewhere with a stable internet connection, and plan what he was going to do next. His laptop was under the passenger seat beside him, the precious roll of film in his pocket, and his phone was in the bottom of his backpack, not only powered off, as it had been all week, but wrapped in the foil emergency blanket. He put his indicator on and looked over his shoulder to pull out onto the highway when he heard a distant roaring noise, almost like the sound inside a seashell, a putter curving up into a whine. Tony's guts felt like they'd turned to water. He released the handbrake and turned the key to start the engine. 
Speeding out of Thorndyke, he kept driving five minutes more, then ten, then fifteen, until at last he pulled off the highway into a gravel lay-by that looked out over a ravine. Experimentally, he turned off the engine and cracked the window, listening hard, but he could hear nothing but birdsong and the wind in the trees. Tony didn't know, but he felt fairly certain that he'd left the drone behind. He was about to resume his journey when two SUVs with dark, tinted windows screamed past him in the opposite direction, heading for Thorndyke. Barely a second later, he heard the squeal of tyres, and the second of the two vehicles reversed back past the lay-by at high speed and then careened sharply sideways to block the bridge over the ravine. The first wasn't far behind. It also reversed past Tony and made a screeching handbrake turn, scorching the tarmac and coming to a hard stop beside the other. Then nothing. They waited. Engines idling. Suspension trembling. Tinted windows dark. Tony felt like he was going to be sick. They were boxing him in. They had been dispatched to find him. Perhaps they'd been dispatched to run him off the road. He looked to his left. There was a low guardrail around the edge of the lay-by, and beyond it, a gravel slope that led steeply down the ravine to a creek. They probably wouldn't be expecting him to leave the car, much less throw himself into the water. Could he chance it? Tony glanced at his backpack on the seat beside him, and then again at the SUVs. Carefully, he released his seatbelt, trying to move as slowly and unobtrusively as possible. He then drove right up to the guardrail, as though he were preparing to execute a three-point turn to return to Thorndyke. Now he was facing back the way he'd come. The driver's door was right next to the guardrail, Tony felt strangely calm. He touched the roll of film in his pocket for luck, counted to three, then grabbed his backpack and threw open the door. He didn't look back. He leapt over the guardrail and flung himself down the slope towards the water. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Tony had tried to land toes pointed downwards into the creek, but the weight of his pack had thrown him off so that one of his knees had hit the water first. His body bumped and bashed its way downstream into the shallows, where he managed to scramble out of the water and into the trees, his waterlogged clothes dragging him down. He lurched and hobbled through the bush, not daring to look back, aware of the nauseating pain that was coursing through his wrist and shattering his ankle every time he took a step. Broken arm, broken ankle, and both on the same side. He tripped over a tree root and fell forward, then took a great, shuddering breath to try to calm himself. The roll of film was still safe in his pocket. His pack liner would have kept the contents of his backpack dry, the emergency medical kit that he always carried, his Swiss army knife, his sleeping bag, a plastic barbecue lighter, his phone, if he ever dared to use it, wrapped in the foil blanket. He thought about his laptop abandoned in Veronica's car. Stupid. He unzipped his pack and took out the emergency kit. One-handed, he untied his left boot and worked it off his foot to gauge the damage to his ankle. Definitely broken. He needed to wrap it up quickly, tightly, and preferably with a splint of some kind. He fished out the plastic barbecue lighter and placed it vertically against his ankle, with the aluminium nozzle pointed down. He wound a bandage around it, as tight as he could bear. He removed the boot lace from the empty boot to form a kind of sling for his wrist. Then he put everything back in his backpack and got to his feet, hopping slightly to keep his weight off his ankle. 
He would keep an eye out for a Y-shaped branch that might serve him as a crutch, he told himself. But in the meantime, he needed to keep moving. Rosie Damani was starting to feel uneasy. She had texted Tony over a week ago. The last thing she wanted was to blow her chance with him by coming off as paranoid or needy. But she'd heard nothing back. He was probably just ghosting her, she thought, and despondently put her phone away. She went to the gym to run it off on the treadmill. Rosie! It was Tony's sister, Veronica. Oh, hey, Rosie said, switching off the treadmill and hopping down. How are you? Veronica had a sly look. So, you and Tony, eh? She said. Yeah, Rosie said. Well, I mean, maybe, you know. I'm so mad at him right now, Veronica said. You know he's down in Thorndike. Well... He asked to borrow my car to get down there, and because he said he was interviewing this confidential source, I was like, of course. But then yesterday, I ran into Katie Vander. Do you know her from Burnham Wood? I guess, Rosie said, yeah. Anyway, I asked her about Tony because he told me that he'd been chucked out of their last meeting. And she said, first of all, that never happened. And second, they're down in Thorndike. Burnham Wood is down in Thorndike right now. What? Rosie said. I know, Veronica said. He totally lied to me. Katie said the whole reason they went down there in the first place is because Mira Bunting met this billionaire. You know, the autonomo guy, the one whose wife... Mira Bunting, Rosie said. There was a pause. I'm totally messing this up, Veronica said. Look, just forget I said anything, all right? Sorry. Red face, she scuttled down to the other end of the gym. Although Rosie had only been on the treadmill 15 minutes, she gathered up her towel and headed to the locker room to change. She thought for a moment and then texted one of her netball teammates who sometimes volunteered with Burnham Wood. Hey girl, she wrote, do you have a contact number for Mira Bunting by any chance? A reply came barely 20 seconds later. Before she'd had time to second guess herself, Rosie had typed a message out. Hi, Mira, she wrote. This is Rosie Damani from school, long time no see. I'm trying to get in touch with Tony Gallo, but his phone is off and I wondered if you might be able to help me out. I know that he was down in Thorndike with you all. Thanks. Take care. Rosie. She sent the message and watched as the tag updated from delivered to read. A second later, a grey bubble appeared, the three animated dots showing that Mira was composing a reply. Then Rosie saw something strange. The grey bubble froze, and then a second later, it disappeared, and the tag changed from red back to delivered. Rosie blinked. There must be a bug in the system. She checked again several minutes later, and then again the next morning. But the tag never altered, and Mira never replied. Late on Thursday night, Shelley was climbing into her sleeping bag when her phone lit up with a message from an unfamiliar number. This is Robert, it read. Are you up? Yes, she texted back. I want to talk to you, he wrote. Come up to the house in half an hour. Surprised, she waited half an hour like he'd asked and then climbed out of her tent as quietly as she could and scurried up the hill towards the farmhouse. Le Moyne was standing in the doorway. Come in, he said. In the living room, he turned on a lamp and sat down on one of the couches, gesturing for her to do the same. So, he said, how are you? Actually, she said, a little overwhelmed, to be honest. Shelley, he said, I wanted you to know that I'm pulling the trigger on the bunker. I've got a crew arriving in the morning, and you're going to start seeing a lot of traffic on and off the property over the next little while. I just wanted to give you a heads up. But tomorrow's the funeral, Shelley said. Isn't it a bit insensitive? I agree, the timing's not ideal, he said. But I'm solving a problem. Jill Darvish got paranoid. She thinks one of you was fucking her husband. Shelley was so astonished that she laughed. What? 
she said. Lemoyne wasn't smiling. We need to give her something else to think about. This is a way to do that. OK, Shelley said. I think I get it. Good, he said. The guys won't bother you. Just stay away from the building side and let them do their work, all right? It sounded like a dismissal. She stood up to leave. But then he seemed to remember something. Oh, just before you go, he said. I've been running some background checks, just routine security stuff, and there's this name that keeps coming up, Tony Gallo. Tony, Shelley said. God, I mean, you should really be asking Mira, because he and Mira have this history. I don't trust Mira, he said. So I'm asking you. She was startled to hear him say as much so plainly. God, she said again. What exactly do you want to know? Mira woke early the next morning and went at once to the terraces above the house. She sat down on a stump to drink the flask of coffee she'd prepared the night before, looking out at the dawn-tipped mountains. Owen Darvish's funeral was at eleven. She'd observe a minute's silence, she thought, or say a prayer, if she could think of what to pray. She poured the last of the coffee into the dirt, left the empty flask on the stump, and went to fetch her fork and trowel, telling herself that she'd spend the morning weeding pumpkins and courgettes. She had reached the end of her second row of pumpkins when she felt the air go still and the earth around her darkened with a few splashing drops that thickened and then intensified into a deluge. Mira put up her hood and dashed back to the stump to collect her flask, bent almost double, reaching out a hand to the place she knew it would be, except it wasn't. The stump was clear. She looked up, squinting through the rain, and there, at the edge of the field, standing partially concealed in the shelter belt of pines, was Tony. Mira was too surprised to even speak. He put his finger over his lips. Where's your phone? He mouthed to her. Dumbly, Mira reached into her pocket to pull it out, but he signalled violently for her to put it back again and beckoned. He was performing all these actions with the same hand, and as Mira came closer, through the rain, she saw that his other arm was in a kind of sling. He looked desperately unwell. She came closer still, and saw that he was holding her flask beneath his broken arm. Now he unscrewed the lid with his free hand and held it out to her, gesturing for her to put her phone inside. Tony, she whispered. But he shook his head, not speaking till she had dropped her phone into the flask with a clunk and he'd replaced the cap and screwed it tight. He said at last, his voice rasping in his throat, You have to help me, Mira. Please. In a few short hours, the lower fields had been transformed into a work site. Mira had set off running down the hill, but as the valley opened up before her, she faltered, for the main gate was standing open, and crawling up the driveway was a train of heavy vehicles, 18-wheelers loaded with shipping containers, diggers, RVs. She turned in bewilderment to see Lemoyne's dark-tinted SUV driving across the field towards her. It drew level with her, and the passenger window slid down. I came to rescue you, said Lemoyne. Some rain. She stared at him. I think your phone must have died, he said. I was trying to call. What's wrong? Mira couldn't speak. What is all this? She said at last, gesturing around her. It's my bunker, said Lemoyne. Tony waited all afternoon for Mira to reappear. Evening fell and he settled down to sleep in his hiding place among the pines, his consciousness flickering, the movement of the branches above him seeming to be whispering his name. Tony! 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 He jolted awake. It wasn't the branches. It was Mira, crunching through the shelter belt, 
feeling her way through the darkness. She hurried over, breathless, slipping one arm out of her backpack. Here, I've brought you... She shoved the contents of her bag towards him. A first aid kit, a box of paracetamol, a bar of chocolate, a sandwich. It's a carnival down there, she said. There are like a thousand people on the property all of a sudden. I'm going to try to bring the van up here tomorrow. You can hide in the back. And I'll just say I'm going to fill it up and nobody will know. All right? But this is to tide you over in the meantime. She was talking very fast, her features all but obscured in the dark. Tony heard a slither in the trees nearby, the synthetic sound of a jacket sliding past a branch. In the next moment, a shape crouched down to peer under the branches of the tree where they were sheltering. A second later came a blaze of yellow light. Well, hello, said a voice on the other end of the torch. You must be Tony. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. You seem surprised, Lemoyne had said that morning, sitting in the driver's seat, watching Mira take in the scene that filled the field. Get in. I have something to tell you. When Lemoyne had intercepted Rosie Damani's message late on Thursday night, he had decided instantly to cut his losses and give the order to his soldiers to pack out, ending the leaching process prematurely, but salvaging, with luck, the better part of the value of his operation in the park. Mira was already a liability. The fact that she and Tony had been known to one another had been a catastrophic oversight on his part. Lemoyne had been hoping he might be able to dispatch Tony quietly in some accidental-seeming way. Reading Rosie's message, he saw that this would be impossible since Tony's death would connect automatically to Mira and through her to him. It had all become too messy. There's a threat against my life, he told Mira. He's a friend of yours, or he used to be. Recognition dawned across her face. Oh, my God, she said. Look, I know Tony, and I promise you this does not make sense. It makes perfect sense, said Lemoyne. I hacked into his laptop. He came down here to find me. He knew where I'd be because you told him. This is a serious situation, Mira. I have the best security on the planet, and they're telling me that this guy is a credible threat. Mira was quiet. But you don't know where he is, she said at last. He didn't move. Do you? No, she said, not looking at him. He watched her for a moment longer and then said abruptly, OK, let me drive you back. A solution was before him. It was perfect. For who wouldn't believe this story? A disaffected, isolated young man, socially downgraded and rejected from a group he once belonged to, tracks his old friends down to Thorndyke, stalks them as they work, convinces himself that they've betrayed their very nature, and then massacres them all. Who could doubt it? And who could doubt that this malevolent subcreature would then kill himself, leaving no survivors at the farm? It was swift and it was clean. He dropped Mira at the shearing shed and returned to the farmhouse, deciding, as he bumped his way across the fields, that he would bring his bodyguard on board. He couldn't carry out this plan alone. Well, hello, he said, shining the torch into the trees. Tony was the first to find his voice. You're going down, he said. I know what you're doing out in Korowai. I took photos. I sent them all around the world. You're done, man. Lemoyne said nothing. He noticed that Tony's arm was in a sling. He was going to have to work with that. As far as Lemoyne could remember, in the Darvish's gun locker there was just the rack of rabbit hunting rifles, none of which could be operated by a guy with a broken arm. Listen to me, he said, 
both of you. This is not the deep state conspiracy you think it is. No laws are being broken. If you come down to the house, I can explain to you what is going on here, all right? They heard the SUV coming up the hill towards them. It drove up to the trees and stopped. I'm going to get in the car now, said Lemoyne. I suggest you follow. He shut off the light and walked out of the shelter belt. His phone was vibrating, and he saw that it was Shelley calling. Mira's gone, Shelley said, sounding out of breath. She's with me, said Lemoyne. I'm going to need to stay with her for a while. She's in a fragile state. OK, said Shelley. Oh, he said, one more thing. I want to call a meeting for tomorrow morning. Could you round everybody up? Make sure everybody's there? I will, she said. Eight o'clock, said Lemoyne. I'll bring breakfast. The SUV pulled up outside the Darvish farmhouse. Lemoyne reached into Tony's jacket pocket and pulled out the Ziploc bag that contained the roll of film. Then the driver half carried Tony into the house and laid him out on the Darvish's bed. Mum, he muttered, tell Mum. Take care of him, Lemoyne said to Mira. We'll talk in the morning. She vowed to watch over him all night, but at some point she must have nodded off. She woke and found that it was morning. Tony was still asleep. Mira went to use the bathroom, and on her way back she turned to see Lemoyne standing in the kitchen doorway. How is he? he said. I'm not a doctor, Mira said. I don't know. Lemoyne studied her. I'm going to make some coffee, he said at last. She followed him into the kitchen and watched as he took the glass jug out of the Darvish's electric coffee maker, filled it at the tap, poured the water into the back of the machine and then spooned coffee into the filter. He shut the lid and turned it on. I thought you didn't drink coffee, Mira said. I don't, said Lemoyne. His gaze slid sideways over Mira's shoulder. Tony was hobbling down the hall towards them. Lemoyne smiled at them. We'll have a bit of breakfast, he said, and then we'll head down to the construction site. There's something there you need to see. Jill Darvish thanked everyone for coming, accepting hugs and agreeing that Sir Owen would have been so happy with the send-off. Then she gathered up her kids and told them she was exhausted now that she'd made it through the funeral. Really, all she needed now was sleep. She said good night, went inside the flat and then called a taxi to come and take her to the airport right away. In Christchurch, she hired a rental car and set off south. Dawn broke as she left the coast and headed inland, past the edge of town to the bottom corner of what was now Lemoyne's property, and along the fence to what was now their shared front gate. She was surprised to see a great many heavy vehicles clustered in the field around it. Surely Lemoyne could not have started work so rapidly, Lady Darvish thought. What was going on? Some instinct told her to be cautious, she decided to keep driving up to the unsealed service road that ran up the southern fence. When she reached the farm gate at the top of the hill, it was coming on to half past nine. She parked beside the farmhouse and let herself in the back door. Robert, she called out, just in case. But the house was still. Coming down the hall, she knew at once that something was wrong. The front door was standing open, and in the kitchen she found the glass jug from the coffee maker smashed across the floor. Adrenalised, she ran down the hall to the garage, fearing that she was going to find the gun cabinet looted, the rack of rifles gone. But it was shut and locked as always, the key back in the flat in Wellington. And then she saw that something else was missing. The plastic drum marked dangerous poison, and sodium fluoroacetate, and 1080 bait for the control of rabbits, 
with an authorising label made out to Mr Owen Darvish of Darvish Pest Control. She heard a scream. It was distant. She guessed it issued from the fields below the house, but it was unmistakably a scream of pain, an abject, terror-stricken cry for help. Lady Darvish ran down the hall to the front room. On a low bookshelf was a special presentation case where Sir Owen's twenty-two air rifle and his skinning knife were displayed. She opened the case and took out the rifle and then hooked it over her arm and scrabbled for the tin of pallets that Sir Owen kept in the top drawer of the desk. She selected a pallet, slipped it into the breech and snapped the barrel shut. She shoved the tin into her pocket and grabbed the skinning knife. She ran in the direction of the sound, scanning the fields around her. As she came over the crest of the hill, Le Moyne was standing with his back to her, one hand in his pocket, scrolling through his phone. On the ground in front of him was a young man with a beard and tangled hair. His left hand was bandaged. His right was bound at the wrist to a young woman whose other hand was bound to the chassis of a truck. Her head was slumped forward, and there was vomit down her front. She was dead, or at the very least, unconscious. Horrified, Lady Darvish tore her gaze away, seeing more bodies, more vomit, all young people, all dead, contorted where they lay, as if they'd discovered all at once that they'd been poisoned and had tried, too late, to run. Le Moyne glanced up from his phone. Lady Darvish said nothing. She advanced towards Le Moyne, holding the rifle level, and as she drew nearer, she felt, suddenly, a transcendent sense of calm. Le Moyne had killed her husband. Le Moyne had done it. Le Moyne was capable of evil. Now she knew, and she had always known. That was a sad thing. She and Owen had known that he was bad right from the start. Still they courted him. Lemoyne was looking at her. She breathed, and then she shot him right between the eyes. The report echoed in the hills around them. Lady Darvish barely heard it. She drew Sir Owen's skinning knife out of its sheath and ran forward with it to cut the cable tie that bound the dead girl and the boy. Is there anybody else? she said, as the plastic snapped and he was free. But the boy was already hobbling away from her, running now. The driver, he said, his voice cracking. Behind you! and she was already half-turning when she caught a spray of bullets in her back. Tony knew he was just about to die, and he wanted to die in the bush, in Korowai, in a place that was green and forgiving and alive. He kept moving, hearing gunfire behind him, hearing it echo in the hills. He reached the border of the National Park, then he climbed the fence with the signs that read, research in progress, please keep out, and dropped down into the service road, and it was only as he fell and his bad leg gave way beneath him that he remembered the barbecue lighter that he had placed against his broken ankle as a splint. He tore off the dirt-soaked bandage and drew it out, and fumbled as he tried to test the trigger. He tried again. It worked. A little dancing flame appeared. He pulled his body forward until he reached the nets that camouflaged the leaching pits, and then he put his good shoulder against a manhole cover, and with the last of his strength, shoved it aside. He pushed one of the nets into the evil-smelling hole and then pulled it out again, and thrust the lighted wand against the sopping fabric, praying that the flame would catch, praying that the fire would send up smoke and burn away the nets so that the scale of the destruction would be visible from overhead, so that somebody would see it, so that somebody would notice, so that somebody would care. And as the fire began to blaze and crackle up the ancient trees around him, Tony prayed that somebody 
would come to put it out.